This is the story of one of the most magnificent creatures on the planet. It's the story of this animal's dependence on plants, like these grasses, and on the lands that support them. It's the story of that creature over there, the Asian elephant. Fossils tell us that the Asian elephant is descended from a long evolutionary history one that is shared with some of the most wonderfully bizarre creatures that have ever walked the earth. Fossils of elephant-like creatures have been found all over the planet, and they date back to 40 million years. Scientists refer to these animals as proboscidae, which simply means those that feed themselves by extending their front. It is a name that comes from a highly mobile upper lip that the elephants use to reach out and gather food. And the modern elephant's trunk fits right into this general pattern. In large part, the trunk is just the extremely elongated upper lip of the elephant. Until very recently, there are about a dozen different species of elephant on Earth, including woolly mammoths and mastodons that lived in cold northern regions, and the ancestors of modern elephants that lived in the tropics. Today there are only two types of proboscidae remaining. They are both tropical in nature, but they come from areas that are quite separate geographically. Although these two species of elephant are superficially similar, it is actually very easy to tell them apart. The African elephant has larger ears than the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant has a more pronounced forehead area than the African elephant. In profile, the back of the Asian elephant arches upward right from its front shoulders to its back hips. The back of the African elephant slopes down over its shoulders, forming a more gradual arch that rises over the hips. Although they seem a lot alike, these two species are not particularly closely related. Their evolutionary lines have been separate for about five million years. In fact, evidence suggests that Asian elephants were more closely related to extinct woolly mammoths of the past than they are to African elephants of today. Perhaps that's why the Asian elephants are often much hairier than their African counterparts. This young beauty is only one year old and she already weighs more than 600 pounds. By the time she's an adult, she will grow to be more than 6,000 pounds and live to be 60 years old. And because she is an Asian, not African elephant, she won't develop prominent tusks. But that doesn't mean she won't develop any tusks at all. Let me show you. Here at the Buffalo Zoo, I have had the good fortune of making friends with Sheba. She is a 48-year-old female Asian elephant. She has a simply wonderful personality and an extremely cooperative disposition. Sheba has been trained with a number of behaviors that allow her veterinarians to give her a thorough exam. And we can take advantage of one of these trained behaviors to get a good look at her tusks. Sheba, trunk. As you can see, even though they're not normally visible, she actually has fairly sizable tusks in here. Each one is about an inch thick and six inches long. And these are not just for show. Female elephants like Sheba will use these trusks to prod other elephants during social interactions and also to rip the bark off of trees when feeding. The tusks of elephants are actually just enormous teeth that grow out of the elephant's upper jaw just like other teeth do. As an individual elephant matures, it lays down new layers of dentine and other compounds within the tooth cavity where the tusk grows. Each new segment is added as an inverted cone. So in this way, the enormous tooth grows longer and longer. Often, the tusk will grow more at certain times of year than others because during the rainy season, nutrition is particularly good because the vegetation is so lush. As a result, a cross section through a tusk will sometimes reveal faint lines that reflect each of the passing seasons. In this way, it's a bit like the growth rings that can be found in the trunks of some trees. And the number of successive growth cones can reflect the age of an individual elephant. 
Now she'll cooperate. We can look even further back in her mouth. Sheba, open. Elephant molars are truly amazing in a number of ways. On each side of her mouth, Sheba has a single tooth that is three inches wide and six inches long. Because they eat such coarse vegetation, elephants need these huge teeth to help them grind up food before swallowing it. But even these enormous teeth have a limit. And over time, the rough vegetation eventually wears them down and eventually they break apart and fall out. And when this happened, a new tooth, which has been developing in the back of the jaw, comes forward to take its place. It's a bit like adult teeth replacing baby teeth in humans, except in elephants, the new teeth grow behind instead of underneath the old one. And even more importantly, this process can occur up to five times over the elephant's lifespan. This is one of the adaptations that have allowed elephants to live very long lives. Thank you, Shiva. In Asia, elephants can be found in habitats ranging from open grasslands to thick forests, and from the Himalayan foothills right down to the shores of the Indian Ocean. They are a tropical species that depends upon the kind of rich, lush vegetation that comes with lots of rainfall. In fact, an ample water supply is critical for any elephant group, and the annual cycle of monsoon rains in the weather pattern of Asia plays a major role in determining where elephants live and why they move from place to place throughout the year. This is because each elephant needs to drink approximately 40 gallons of water every day. That is an easy thing to do during the rainy season when running streams are available everywhere. However, during the dry seasons, elephants often need to travel over long distances just to find enough water to satisfy their needs. More than just drinking the water, elephants almost always bathe in it as well. This seems to be a very important part of their skin care, as well as an important way in which they cool off. It also, quite frankly, appears to be just plain fun for them. Whatever the reason, it is in the nature of elephants, if they encounter open water, for them to wade in, wallow around, or even roll and swim using their trunks like snorkels. In fact, they enter the water so often and they move so well when in it, some scientists refer to elephants as almost semi-aquatic in nature. In terms of a measure called biomass, the elephant is the dominant form of animal life in tropical Asia. This is a concept used by scientists that assesses an animal's population in terms of overall weight, as opposed to number of individuals. If you were to simply count heads, there are actually many other plant-eating species that are more numerous than the elephant. These include the water buffalo, the wild boar, the axis deer, and many others. But when the number of these individuals is multiplied by their average body weight, elephants are predominant. In plain English, the plants that grow in the forests and grasslands of tropical Asia support more pounds of elephants as a life form than any other species of animal. The average elephant consumes about 300 pounds of plant material every day. Grasses make up most of an elephant's daily diet. This means that on most days, elephants travel to find clearings or open fields at the edge of forests where grasses are plentiful. They spend hours of each day gathering grasses with their trunks, sometimes also arranging it with their feet, and then pounding it in order to get rid of dirt before putting it into their mouths. But elephants cannot maintain good health or even survive on grass alone. Like most herbivores, elephants depend on beneficial bacteria that produce necessary enzymes inside their digestive systems, enzymes that are able to break down the cellulose in plant cells and convert it to a source of energy for the elephants. In a way, the elephant is really feeding the bacteria in its digestive system, which in turn feeds the elephant. But neither these bacteria nor the elephant itself can live on energy alone. Just like us, they also need a minimal level of protein in their diet. And this presents quite a challenge to the elephant because grasses and leaves are a poor source of protein. This means that an elephant must often search for plants that are in their active growing stage because new leaf buds and growing stems have more protein than mature plants. And it is not just the search for protein alone that moves elephants away from the plentiful grasslands. There are other necessary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, and so on, that elephants also need in their diet. We don't have to infer that the elephants understand nutrition in a conscious way. It is just that they have a taste for certain plant species, and that is enough to drive them to gather in the appropriate foods. To satisfy their needs, elephants usually move a great deal each day. 
seeking out and eating small amounts of many different plant species. It is not unusual for a family group to wander 10 miles per day, and naturalists have counted 112 different plant species that elephants consume at one time or the other. They live very long lives and appear to remember locations of desirable plant species from year to year, and even from decade to decade. By leading the groups from place to place, the older elephants gradually pass this knowledge down to the younger ones. But it is their taste for nutritious plant material and their tendency to travel that also brings elephants into conflict with humans. Throughout Asia, wherever elephants are found, it is not unusual for them to eventually wander out of the forest and into cultivated farms and fields in order to munch on the delicious crops that humans have planted there. You can hardly blame the elephants. All they know is what their instincts and taste buds tell them. But, unfortunately, even a small herd of elephants can create a disaster from a human's point of view. Farmers regularly watch over their fields and stands like this one, and they shoot off firecrackers when elephants approach. But hungry elephants are difficult to discourage, and they even get used to firecrackers. As a result, all too often, elephants that enter farms are shot as a last resort. This sums up an essential problem in elephant conservation, and it is a problem that unfortunately applies to many animal species. When land gets put to human use, it becomes unavailable for use by most wild animals. In a very real sense, the increase in human population is the number one wildlife conservation issue. In just the past 100 years, the human population of Asia has increased from 500 million to two and a half billion. And during that same century, the population of Asian elephants plummeted from about one half million to only 40,000. It is a simple equation. More room for people means less room for elephants. The ecological range of the Asian elephant includes the entire Indian subcontinent. About 20,000 elephants remain there. And there are about 20,000 other elephants that can be found in areas ranging from Malaysia and Thailand in the southeast to the island of Sri Lanka in the west. Although 40,000 individuals is still a substantial number, and a number that could ideally make up a healthy population, many of the remaining elephants are unfortunately isolated in pockets of forest that are effectively cut off from one another. And this is a real problem for a species whose nature is to travel extensively, and which needs frequent intermixing across groups for healthy breeding. Over time, we have come to understand that the only real way to preserve this species is by setting aside large areas of land as nature preserves. Fortunately, this is being done in a number of places. In fact, here in Sri Lanka, I am standing in one of the largest and one of the oldest nature preserves on the planet. 2,000 years ago, the princes and kings of Sri Lanka set this land aside and many hundreds of kilometers around it as a hunting preserve. In those days, the hunting activity was quite low in terms of its overall impact on the animals. So in effect, this area has been a nature preserve for over two millennia. And ever since that time, under one form of government or another, and over the course of all these centuries, the people of Sri Lanka have kept this land set aside for nature preservation. So that today, in modern times, it is a national park. In fact, Sri Lanka has an extensive system of national parks, some so large that they provide a real sense of optimism about the preservation of wild populations of elephants here. The lesson here is that wildlife conservation can be successful if enough people express the will and the commitment to do it. Wild populations of elephants can and will be maintained if we humans continue to set aside large tracts of land as nature preserves. This is a very good thing that has trickle-down effects to all other inhabitants of the same ecosystem. When people set aside land like this to preserve much-loved species like elephants, they are also preserving the land for the many other forms of life that occupy these zones. Besides elephants, there are 85 species of mammals and 375 species of birds in this park, including these buffalo, axis deer, langer monkeys, ruddy mongoose, green bee-eater, fish eagle, water monitor, and so on. But even these numbers look small when compared to the thousands of unique species of mushrooms, ferns, fruiting trees, and teeming forms of botanical and microscopic life that live in this unique ecosystem. In a way, the elephant is a flagship species that is leading the way in a win-win system of wildlife conservation. People here in Asia and all around the world fall in love with elephants and work to preserve habitat for them. 
And by doing this, their efforts help to preserve the rest of all this wonderful life at the same time. A typical herd of elephants like this one is actually a big family unit, led by the single oldest female in the group. Scientists call this elephant the matriarch. She spends her days surrounded by her younger sisters and her own grown daughters, both of which usually have babies of their own. The whole family works together to care for each other and to protect the young ones. And this means that elephants are one of the few animals on Earth besides humans that live in a society of grandparents. This is something that we take for granted in human families. But just think about it. Individuals of most animal species either don't live long enough or don't stay together long enough for any individual to get to know their own offspring as adults, let alone to have an opportunity to care for their offspring's offspring as grandparents. Humans are really very unusual in this regard. And so are elephants. In this group, the matriarch is the one in the back. She's 45 years old and very experienced. That is her oldest daughter on the right, and those are her granddaughters standing in the foreground. The presence of a grandmother like this is a very normal and common aspect of life among elephants, just as it is among people. Like many herd animals, elephant babies typically get to their feet within a half hour of birth and are able to follow along with the herd not long after that. Like babies everywhere, they spend much of their time playing and exploring their world. The baby nurses with its mouth, not its trunk, just behind its mother's front legs. The calf nurses very often throughout the day, and it is dependent on its mother for nearly all of its nourishment for the first year of its life. After that, it gradually begins to nibble on plants side by side with its mother while it tapers off its nursing until the age of two or three. The bond between a baby elephant and its mother can be correctly described as the closest of any animal on Earth. If it is a female baby, she will remain together with her mother right into her own adulthood. She will likely never once be separate until her mother's own death in old age. Male baby elephants are also very closely bonded to their mothers when they are young. But in their case, it is not for a lifetime. When an adolescent male elephant reaches puberty, around the age of 12, he gets way too rowdy for the others to tolerate. He repeatedly feels an uncontrollable urge to wrestle and fight with other elephants. And whenever this happens, his mother and grandmother clearly become irritated with him and escort him to the edge of the group to get him to stop. This goes on month after month throughout his puberty until the disapproval by the females becomes so intense that he is chased away altogether. He then becomes what is known as a solitary bull elephant. In the wild, whenever you see an elephant alone, you can safely bet it is an adult male. Just as female elephants never like to be alone and choose to spend their entire lives in the company of their mothers, sisters, and daughters, the very opposite is true of adult males. Once they leave their family herd at puberty, they spend the rest of their lives, 30 or more years, wandering the forests and fields alone. And there is something else that is very unusual about elephant males. Every few months, individual males go in and out of a period known as must, in which their testosterone levels rise sharply. They secrete a thick oil from the temporal glands on the side of their heads. Moreover, they become very irritable and pick a fight with any other male elephant that they encounter. In many ways, it reminds biologists of the seasonal aggressive period that occur in some other species. For example, the males of these North American elk undergo a period called the rut every autumn. Like the elephant, the males of this species also spray a strong smelling urine, and they also become very aggressive with each other. We feel that we have a pretty clear understanding of this phenomenon in elk. This is the main way that males compete with each other during the breeding season. But the situation is less clear in elephants. The odd thing is that different male elephants go into must at different times of the year. In other words, male elephants go through their aggressive periods individually, without being synchronized to each other and without being synchronized to any particular season. At this point, it's very difficult for scientists to understand how this periodic aggressive phase is adaptive. Whether a male elephant is in must or not, he spends most of his time on the move looking for females. And whether he is in must or not, he will eagerly breed with any receptive female that he encounters. It is most unusual, and at this point, it is something that we have to admit that we just don't understand very well about male elephants. On top of this, there is also something we do not fully understand about female elephants either. 
Basically, estrogen and progesterone levels rise and fall over the course of a 12-week hormonal cycle in much the same way as it does in females of other species. However, when female elephants experience their first LH surge within each cycle, they evidently cannot become pregnant, even if they mate with a male. As far as scientists can tell, female elephants ordinarily come into heat again with a second LH surge three weeks later, and it is only with the second period of receptivity that they can actually become pregnant. We know of no other species of animal in which double LH spikes like this occur, and we can only speculate about how this is beneficial to the elephants. We simply do not know. All we can say at this point is that the reproductive rules that apply to nearly all other mammal species do not function the same way in elephants. In any event, whatever the intricacies of the elephant reproductive system may be, it all seems to work out very well here in the wild. But it just as often appears to fail in captivity. People working in the zoo field have been very disappointed to learn that they are one of the very few animals that reproduces less successfully in captivity than it does in the wild. For example, consider the case of Jody. She is another female Asian elephant here at the Buffalo Zoo. She is a young adult in the prime of her life, and if she were in the wild, she would surely either be pregnant by now or already be raising a young baby of her own. Careful analysis of the hormone levels in her urine have shown that her reproductive system is cycling normally. And a thorough examination by a veterinarian has shown that she is in excellent health in all other regards. Consequently, when she was recommended to participate in the Species Survival Plan coordinated by the American Zoological Association, she was moved to another zoo for a year for breeding. All evidence showed that she settled in quite well with the elephants there, and she was even observed right on schedule to mate with their male. However, inexplicably, Jody never became pregnant, and no one quite understands why. And the sad part is that the case of Jody is not at all unusual. Elephants in captivity everywhere are reproducing at a rate that is only about one-fourth of their wild counterparts. And this is most unusual because nearly all other species respond to the good nutrition and lack of predation in captivity by reproducing at a rate that is much higher than that seen in the wild. The one thing that elephants like Jody have taught us is that with this species, it obviously takes more than simply bringing a male and female together. And this is a most urgent problem because even in the best of conditions, elephants are very slow reproducers. When an elephant does get pregnant, she has a gestation period of 22 months and after that, she will nurse her baby for an additional 22 months. That means that a female elephant can only have one baby every four years. That is probably the slowest reproduction rate of any animal. All we can think to do at this time is to make captive conditions more and more like those in the wild. And this is an idea that is gaining increasing support in the zoo community. The thinking is that we need to allow elephants to live in much larger groups, in much larger areas, and to form the equivalent of extended families like those seen in wild populations. Here at Pinawala Elephant Orphanage in Sri Lanka, 62 captive elephants have been brought together. And this is a place of great optimism and hope because Pinawala has the highest breeding success of any captive facility. This seems to reinforce the notion that the closer we bring conditions to those in the wild, the more successful the elephants will be at reproducing. In facilities like this, veterinarians and scientists can continue to study the biology and the needs of these creatures so that we can do an increasingly better job of managing them both in captivity and in the wild. So, human population growth and habitat encroachment constitute an enormous threat to elephants, and the proper management of captive populations presents another big challenge. But for those of us concerned with elephant conservation, there is a third issue, and this is the most serious of all. It is the direct killing of elephants by poachers for the ivory trade. For thousands of years, people have valued elephant tusks as a sign of status and wealth. And artists in many cultures have specialized in carving elephant tusks into intricate figurines. For example, these carvings date from the 19th century in China. The ivory itself is a truly beautiful substance. In the hands of a skilled artist, it can be turned into genuinely magnificent pieces of art. This, of course, is a terrible situation from the elephant's point of view. The art world is populated by collectors who are willing to pay handsome prices for objects of beauty. And as long as that is true, as long as there is a market for ivory and for objects of art made of ivory, there will be people willing to shoot elephants to obtain their tusks. 
the hunting of elephants for ivory has already had a devastating impact on their population. In the past century alone, more than 100,000 Asian elephants have been killed for their ivory. And the deliberate killing by people for this purpose has been the number one cause of death for this species. In Asian elephants, it is the males that grow large tusks, so it has almost always been the males who have been killed for the ivory trade. In fact, the pressure from hunters has been so great that it has created an enormous artificial selection process in many areas. In the distant past, a tuskless male like this one was a very rare thing, but when they did occur, they were almost always passed over by ivory hunters. Consequently, over the years, tuskless males were much more likely to survive into adulthood and therefore had a better chance of breeding. And this meant that more and more of the offspring of each successive generation inherited the trait of being tuskless too. Because of this, in some modern populations of Asian elephants, tuskless males have actually come to predominate in terms of numbers. In this way, the artificial selection created by mankind's relentless hunting has been altering one of the natural traits of this species. If we want to conserve elephants, we simply have to eliminate the ivory trade and the poaching that feeds it. As long as there is a demand for ivory, there will be poachers and black marketers who will feed that demand. On the other hand, if people stop buying ivory, then people will stop killing elephants to obtain their ivory. When people everywhere come to understand that ivory products come from dead elephants and that the purchase of ivory products causes the killing of elephants, then the deaths will stop. This is an attitude, a cultural value that we should change. And this is an attitude that we can change. Those of us who care about the conservation of elephants should work to spread the word about the ivory trade. We should do this politely and we should do this patiently, but we should never give up. Carved ivory should not be desired for its beauty. Ivory should not be valued or displayed as works of art. Most ivory products were derived from elephants that were specifically killed so their tusks could be carved. We should not see this as a thing of beauty. We should be polite and we should be patient. But attitudes can change and on this subject attitudes should change. It is not art. It is the carved body part of a killed elephant. In the future, Asian elephants face many challenges, but these young elephants should provide us all with a sense of optimism. People everywhere are beginning to show a willingness and a real commitment to preserving wild spaces for elephants. And cultures are changing in ways that will help to stop the ivory trade. If we all act together, the future will be one in which our own grandchildren will share the planet with future generations of these young elephants. To learn more about our program, please visit www.kanishas.edu CAC. But even more importantly, if you want to help preserve elephants, we recommend you visit www.elephantconservation.org. My name is Lindsay Shamel, and I'm a member of the Canisius College Ambassadors for Conservation. The opportunity to work with elephants and to learn more about them has been truly inspiring. I very much hope that you too have been motivated to take steps in your own lives to help spread the word about wildlife conservation. I also hope that you will support efforts to protect wild areas both locally and globally. I firmly believe that the more people understand wild animals, the more they will respect them and care about their welfare. If we all work together, we can make the world a better place. We really can.